Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third annual CSULB Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm Art Levine, the director of the series, and we're delighted that you're joining us tonight. Here to welcome you on behalf of CSULB is our president, Dr. F. King Alexander. Thank you, Art, and welcome, everybody, to this uh, third annual speaker series. Uh, this is a very interesting night for us because I remember uh, if you paid attention to PBS lately, there's a story that was written in 1857 about a Ponzi scheme, a banker who ran a Ponzi scheme throughout London and basically put half of London under and sent many people to debtor's prison. He eventually, uh, Mr. Myrtle was his name, he eventually uh, led to the collapse of the Great Myrtle Bank in London. Fortunately, fortunately, this is a Charles Dickens piece and it's just fictional and it can't ever happen to us. Uh, uh, on behalf of the faculty, on behalf of our great staff, and on behalf of our 36,000 student body strong, I'd like to welcome you to our campus, welcome many of you back. Uh, this is a very interesting night that I hope we'll take a lot away from as we go throughout the evening. And there's a lot to be learned from what has happened. We're all living with the reality of what was caused on Wall Street and living with the reality in our state governments as well as throughout our campuses as you see the daily events that unfold, whether it's the the uh, protests at UCLA or other type ramifications that go on throughout the country. So we're very glad that you're here. We hope you enjoy this evening and go beach. Before introducing our speaker, let me uh, mention that we'll be having a panel discussion that will follow uh, his remarks. It's an important part of the evening. We'll also be inviting questions uh, from the audience and please write uh, your questions on the uh, index cards that are included in the program and uh, write legibly. Please keep them short and pass them to the aisles and ushers will bring them up and we will address your questions to the uh, speaker. Uh, we also will have audio tapes of the presentation and the panel discussion available for sale and the speaker will be signing books at the conclusion of the presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our 2009 CSULB Distinguished Speaker, uh, William D. Cohn. Mr. Cohn has written two bestsellers about Wall Street. He's a trained journalist and he spent 17 years on the street as an investment banker. He is perhaps uniquely qualified to talk about the meltdown and suggest ways to avoid one in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, William D. Cohn. Hello, hello everyone. There, it's working. I want to thank uh, Dr. Alexander and Art Levine because uh, let me tell you something, this is uh, uh, a, a very well-oiled machine and a very uh, classy organization and I am uh, privileged to be here tonight to talk to you all about uh, what I think is a very important topic and that is um, uh, how this financial crisis happened and why it happened and uh, uh, maybe if we uh, uh, learn that story we can prevent it from happening again. Uh, you know, when I uh, first started to uh, think about how to talk about this book, which uh, I actually started writing on March 17, 2008, which uh, many of you will think of as St. Patrick's Day. I like to think of uh, it as the day that J.P. Morgan Chase bought Bear Stearns for $2 a share. And uh, over the next eight months, uh, which has to be some sort of crazy record, uh, I wrote this book, uh, interviewed uh, hundreds of people, uh, reviewed thousands of documents, uh, and finished writing it uh, on December 1st, 2008. And of course, uh, in the meantime, while I was writing it, uh, not only Bear Stearns, but the rest of Wall Street uh, melted down in September and October of, of last year. Uh, and people would say to me, well, uh, Bill, you're writing about Bear Stearns. Uh, don't you think you ought to you know, switch gears and 
you know, write about Lehman Brothers or AIG or Merrill Lynch or, or the rest of Wall Street that collapsed. And um, uh, I knew that for a lot of people that might have been tempting to, to switch gears and try something else. Uh, but actually, I uh, determined even more so that the way to really understand what happened here is by understanding what happened at Bear Stearns. It was sort of the canary in the coal mine, or as I like to say, the Rosetta Stone of the financial crisis. If you can understand what happened at Bear Stearns and why, and by the way, I don't think many people do, uh, then you can understand why we're in this fix and what we can try to do to get out of it. And so when I began to think about how to talk about the book, uh, I was asked to speak in uh, uh, Idaho, in uh, a, a beautiful uh, place called Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is about as far away as you can get from my uh, home in New York City as possible. It's in uh, uh, northern Idaho, a beautiful lake. And um, I was speaking to a convention of state and local legislators who um, I was very concerned about would might be uh, in danger of losing their jobs because of what had happened on Wall Street, and it wasn't their fault. It wasn't even remotely their fault. And I thought, if I can do nothing else when I speak to these folks, I can try to explain to them how this happened and why, so that they can use this ammunition that I hopefully am giving them to go back and tell their constituents that, hey, it wasn't my fault. I know that our state and local budgets are being cut mercifully, mercifully mercilessly, but here's what happened and why, and hopefully you'll, you'll re-elect me. Now that was the, the idea that I used to, to talk about the book, and I don't know the outcome because the election was just recently. I, I hope a lot of them used what I told them and kept their jobs, but I don't, but I don't know that. And so I wanted to, you know, that same logic that I used uh, for, the, for these folks, I, I, I hope I can bring here tonight as well, and that is to try to explain to you the DNA of this crisis, how it happened, why it happened, and you know where we go from here. And uh, when I first started writing the book on March 17th, uh, you know I'd worked at a lot of places on Wall Street. I, I worked at Lazard, which was the topic of my first book. I worked at Merrill Lynch, which of course you know imploded last September of 08 and was bought by Bank of, Bank of America. I worked at what became J.P. Morgan Chase, which was one of the survivors of this crisis in relatively good shape. Uh, I had been offered a job at Bear Stearns, but I, I didn't take it, which I think might have been a good decision. And uh, I didn't really know a whole lot of people at Bear Stearns. Uh, and I have to confess that when I first started writing the book, I felt a little bit like an ambulance chaser, which is not at all what a journalist, an investigative reporter wants to feel like. Uh, uh, but I knew I had a mission, and I had to tell this story, and that meant sort of diving in uh, into, into this situation where basically uh, when I got there, there was a, a body lying on the ground with a knife in its back, and uh, the lights went on, and everybody's pointing fingers at everybody else, and so this very quickly for me became like uh, an Agatha Christie novel, and I had to figure out who done it and why. And, uh, within weeks of, of the firm imploding, uh, Alan Schwartz, who was the uh, CEO of Bear Stearns uh, from January of 2008 to March of 2008, which probably uh, three months tenure as CEO has to rank as one of the shortest on record. And by the time I started writing in early April, he had appeared in front of the Senate Banking Committee. And the reason for his appearance, along with uh, uh, Jamie Dimon, who was the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, who was the buyer of Bear Stearns, as well as people like Tim Geithner and Bob Steele, who was the uh, Deputy uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, and uh, Ben Bernanke, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, they were there to try to explain to the Senate how this had happened and why. And right away, uh, Alan Schwartz, I think, uh, came out with what quickly became the conventional wisdom about this crisis, which was that this was a once-in-a-lifetime tsunami that Bear Stearns was a victim of. There was nothing that he could do about it. It was too late by the time it happened, uh, by the time he got there as CEO, which, of course, may have been true, but he, he ignored the fact that he had been on the executive committee of Bear Stearns for the previous uh, uh, 15 years, uh, and that... You know, he said he was going to, you know, said spend a lot of time thinking about what he could have done differently, and his conclusion was there was nothing he could have done differently. 
And by the way, that was the same logic that Dick Fald used, Dick Fald being the CEO of Lehman Brothers, uh, and he had a similar uh, public uh, dressing down, you may remember, in October of 2008. He appeared before a House committee after Lehman Brothers had imploded and went into bankruptcy, and he said a version of what Alan Schwartz had said, and he said something like, he'll go to his grave wondering how it happened. And so very quickly, Wall Street defined for all of us, and I think in a very reprehensible way, the conventional wisdom about how this crisis happened and why, which is, hey, we are just victims. We don't know how this happened. This was a once in a century event, and we just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It actually wasn't until about a month or so after uh, uh, Allen appeared in front of the Senate Banking Committee that I met a guy named Paul Friedman. Nobody, nobody knows who Paul, Fried, Paul Friedman is, but Paul Friedman was the chief operating officer of the fixed income group at Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns, uh, the fixed income group at Bear Stearns, which was a business that underwrote debt securities, uh, uh, was the engine of the firm. Around 90% of the revenue and 90% of the profits came from this business. And he was the chief operating officer, and he'd seen any number of heads of the fixed income group come and go. And he told me, quite apart from what Alan Schwartz had said, now, you have to remember, Paul was one layer down from the Alan Schwartzes of the world. Paul said, this is something we did to ourselves. We did this to ourselves. So all of a sudden, I had my mantra. We did this to ourselves. I had to then figure out, based on what Paul Friedman had told me on the record, I might add, we did this to ourselves. And it became my duty as a journalist and as a chronicler of this event to try to figure out what he meant. And so this is what I found out about what Paul Friedman meant. We have to go into a little bit of uh, ancient history in and around uh, 1970 to really begin to think about the origins of this crisis. There are many strands of the DNA of this, and I'm going to try to enunciate them for you. The first thing you have to remember about Wall Street is that once upon a time, it was a series of private partnerships where the capital of these firms was the partner's money. They shared in the profits of the firm, pro rata, based on whatever deals they could cut amongst themselves. And they also shared in the liabilities of these firms, up into including their entire net worths. Their entire net worths were on the line every time they went down to their firms and did business. Now, by the way, these are firms that basically nobody ever heard of. Nobody in the real world did much business with them. That wasn't the way our country functioned. I mean, these were small businesses, small partnerships, and you only intersected with Wall Street if you wanted to raise some money or wanted some M&A advice, merger, advice on mergers and acquisitions. But, you know, basically the brokerage business was very small. The asset management business was very small. And Wall Street was always a dangerous place. It's an extremely Darwinian place. And firms went in and out of business all the time. And uh, as, since it was a risky place, people were very careful about you know, the kind of businesses they got into. And so if something went wrong, or if your partner did something stupid and cost you, the firm, you know, millions of dollars, it all came out of everyone's pockets pro rata. And that made people very, very focused on the kinds of decisions that their partners were doing. And they made sure as best they could, that their partners weren't engaged in rogue behavior. Now, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It happened all the time. And firms went in and out of business all the time. And firms, you know, very nearly went out, went out of business all the time. I, I wrote about Lazard, and Lazard almost went bankrupt two or three times in, in the 20th century alone. Goldman Sachs, which is the subject of my next book, almost went bankrupt, you know, five times by my count at the moment alone. And now, of course, we think of them as this dominant powerhouse so one of the overriding themes, by the way, of, of my book and, and, of, and of this crisis is that it's about people. It's about people making decisions. It's about people failing to make decisions. It's about people taking risks they didn't understand. And in and around 1970, Wall Street began to change from this series of private partnerships into, of course, public companies. And the first company to do that was a company named Donaldson Lovegren Genret. Uh, they had to change the New York Stock Exchange rules so the DLJ could go public. And of course, the floodgates opened, then Merrill Lynch went public, 
then Morgan Stanley went public, Bear Stearns went public in 1985, Goldman Sachs went public in 1999, and even my dear friends at Lazard went public in May of 2005. And basically Wall Street got transformed from this series of private partnerships that no one ever heard of, where people shared in the profits rateably based on you know, the deals they cut with the senior partners to, and had their full net worths on the line for their liabilities to a series of public companies that we all now recognize and supposedly admire. And what happened though as a result of that, and this is a very important strand of the DNA, is that you had people going from taking risks with their own money and being very careful about the risks they were taking with their own money to taking risks with other people's money, taking risks with their creditors' money, taking risks with their shareholders' money. And all of a sudden, all they cared about, instead of the long-term profitability of the firm and the careful, prudent risk-taking that their firms were engaged in, they cared about themselves. They cared about their own bonuses. They cared about getting, generating as much revenue as they possibly could in any given year so that then they could go to their bosses and argue about what big bonus they deserved. And what other business on the face of the earth, by the way, pays out between 50 and 60% of every dollar of revenue in the form of bonuses and compensation to their employees? No other company, no other industry uh, in this country does that, but Wall Street does that. So all of a sudden, you have people who forget that they're, you know, have got partners and that their responsibilities lay with investing their shareholders, their creditors' money prudently, and all they care about is getting as big a bonus as they possibly can. You ask now, Bill, how do you know about this? Why are you such an expert about this? Well, I know about this because I spent 17 years on Wall Street. And now, admittedly, six of those years were at Lazard. And by the way, when I was at Lazard, I got paid a fraction of what I got paid elsewhere because they were more concerned about the money going into the partnerships, partners' pockets, not their employees' pockets. But on the rest of Wall Street, Everybody was focused on getting as big a bonus as they possibly could each and every year. If it turned out that the things that they were selling to generate revenue were bogus, were toxic, well, that's too bad for everyone else because I've already got my bonus, it's in my pocket, and I've already turned it into a Fifth Avenue co-op or a place in the Hamptons or a Ferrari or whatever it is that I want. And, you know, whatever happens is, is the future and I'm not going to worry about that. So the first strand of the DNA is this transformation of Wall Street from private partnerships to public companies from a, from a series of where people were very focused on the risks they were taking to uh, an environment where people were taking risks without any kind of idea what kind of risks they were taking. They were only concerned about selling. And Wall Street is nothing but a huge selling machine. The second part of this uh, strand of this DNA is that Wall Street is very, very good at financial innovation. Well, that shouldn't be all that surprising, considering the amount of money that people are paid to go there and the amount of talent that Wall Street is able to uh, attract as a result, maybe to the detriment of many other industries in our country and many other uh, ways to make a living. Uh, Wall Street became a bit of a black hole in the last 25 years. And as a result, there was a lot of financial innovation. For, for an example, just down the street from here, or down the road in Los Angeles, there was a guy by the name of Mike Milken who sat at the X-shaped desk and created what became known as the junk bond market, the high yield market. And you know, originally, before he engaged in criminal behavior and before he took off his hairpiece, <laughs> he was actually greatly admired because what he did was actually an incredible insight. He made capital available to companies across this country and the world who otherwise wouldn't have access to it in any other way. He made capital available to small and mid-sized companies for whom there was no other way, virtually any price for them to get capital, which of course is the lifeblood of capitalism, which is the lifeblood for how they could grow their businesses, hire new people, expand their plant and equipment. And Mike Milken was a genius. He really was, and I, and I think he still is a genius, and he's to be applauded for what he came up with. But this kind of financial innovation also, you know, extended to internet IPOs. You may remember this phenomenon in the 1990s, the late 1990s, if you were a 
kid coming out of a college like this and you decide to live in a loft south of Market Street in San Francisco and you had a bunch of your buddies and you talked about the internet and eyeballs and paradigm shift, well, Wall Street got you know, very excited about that and created internet IPOs. And next thing you know, uh, there was, you know, uh, profits didn't matter. All that mattered was how many people were you know, attracted to your website. And the next thing you know, your company was worth billions of dollars. And, and Wall Street got completely taken away by that phenomenon. And I guess you could say that was good because it allowed capital to flow into these companies and into a, 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 a paradigm shifting technology, which was the internet, which obviously we all know now is extremely important to our lives. But Wall Street got carried away with that as well. And then, you know, you'd have to remember that in the early 1980s, we have the grandfather, the godfather of what became this crisis. A guy by the name of Lou Ranieri, who was a partner at Solomon Brothers, who came up with the, and by the way, nobody, nobody knows who Lou Ranieri is, but, but I do, and that's because he created what became the asset securitization market. He created this business of taking streams of cash flows, whether they're people, you and I, paying our credit card bills or paying our auto payments, car, car loans, or yes, our mortgage payments on our homes. You know, once upon a time, you'd get a mortgage from your local banker who would size you up and decide whether you were credit worthy and make you a loan for a, a mortgage for a house that he thought you could you know, afford by carefully underwriting your ability to pay him back. And he would make that mortgage to you and that was a bet he was making on you. And, and he would keep that loan on his books as an asset of the bank. And if you paid your mortgage, which he hoped you'd do, that, that loan had value. And if you didn't, that loan had no value. And that's why he was very, very careful about sizing you up, making sure he knew you, and making sure you were going to pay it back. Well, thanks to Lou Ranieri, that all changed. Because Lou Ranieri, who I think as well was a genius, and, and like Mike Milken, created what, you know, expanded the democratization of capital, as I call it, he made capital available to people who wanted to use credit cards, who wanted to buy, have car loans, and yes, who wanted to buy uh, homes, which is of course part of the American dream, and wanted to, you know, have something that everybody else had. And he took all of these mortgages, he came up with this system of taking all of these mortgages from all of these local banks and packaging them up into securities, slicing them up into little pieces and selling them to investors all over the world. Now that was a brilliant idea because that, you know, got capital into the hands of the people who wouldn't otherwise have it. And by the way, it lowered mortgage interest rates dramatically. And so you have to say that was a good thing. But unfortunately, when you combine that with the first part of this puzzle, this crazy compensation system that rewards people to sell, 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 and generate as much revenue as they possibly can so that they can get as big a bonus as they possibly can, when you marry these first two things together, you get a disaster, which is why this isn't the first time we've had a financial crisis in this country. In fact, since I went to Wall Street in September of 87, within a month of me getting to Wall Street, we had the crash of October of 87, when the market fell 22.6% in one day, I saw grown men cry in front of Quotron machines, wondering how this could have possibly happened, and vowing, you know, praying to God that this would never happen again. We had big reports done by the Brady Commission, a two-inch thick document that I guarantee you I'm the only person who's read in about 20 years, vowing, doing what we could to prevent this from not happening again. And this is unfortunately about the fifth time this has happened in those 25 years. This time it was the worst. And it was the worst because the firms were so much bigger. The, the, the cancer that was created with these mortgage-backed securities that was spread all around the world was so much more extraordinary. And, you know, in many ways... Uh, you know, there are a, a lot of, uh, uh, or, or a good portion of the blame, you know, has to rest with the people, unfortunately, and, and not the majority of the blame, but a, but, but a good chunk of it, with, with the people who took out mortgages that they couldn't afford to pay back. And, you know, that's a whole story that we have to keep in mind. Uh, I spent a, a day down uh, in the writing of this book, uh, down in Baltimore, at basically a, a place that was a halfway house, if you will, for people having trouble paying their mortgages. And all day long, either on the phone 
or online or coming through the door of this place. People who were having trouble paying their mortgages would come in and try to get guidance about how to contact the bank or contact uh, you know, a mortgage broker, do anybody they could talk to who would help them work through their mortgages. And at the end of the day, after I had witnessed this, which was really extraordinary, I went and looked at a stack of documents, loan documents, the original loan documents that people had, had been filled out for people. And of course, this is not going to come as any surprise to you all, because uh, it's been well documented elsewhere. But I, I saw these loan documents, and there was not one thing on the loan document itself that was accurate. Not the amount of money in these people's bank account, not the car they drove, not the job they had, not the credit card uh, bill outstandings that they had paid or not paid. Nothing. Not one thing. Now, you or I would never sign such a loan document. How could we sign something that was complete fiction? But in fact, the only thing that was accurate on these loan documents was the signature of the borrowers at the bottom of the loan documents. And so therefore, it was not really a surprise when two months later, these people who had always been renters were now unable to pay back uh, their mortgages. And unfortunately, when you package up securities, all these mortgages into securities and sell them all around the world as investments, when people who took out the mortgages cannot pay them back, the securities that were derived from these mortgages begin to lose a tremendous amount of value, and that's in large part what happened. So those are the first two strands of this. The third strand of it, again, will come as no surprise to you because it takes a lot to make a disaster along the lines that we got here, uh, is public policy. So there was a lot of problems with our you know, government priorities. And it really began in the middle of the Clinton administration, and it continued throughout the end of the Clinton administration, and through both terms of the Bush administration, you'll be glad to know, and that is a high priority that was placed by both those administrations on home ownership. And you can say to yourself, well, that, make, that makes sense. Home ownership is part of the American dream. And, 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 you know, it's good public policy or good politics anyway to encourage home ownership. And so you can go on the Internet and you can see Clinton speaking in front of huge American flags or Bush speaking in front of huge American flags, talking about the benefit and the wisdom of home ownership. And so they, they took it one step further instead, in, in addition to proselytizing about it. They, uh, Clinton... Uh, changed something called the Community Reinvestment Act, which he actually required banks to make loans, home mortgages available, to people who had previously been renters and who wouldn't normally otherwise have access to home mortgages with the idea of encouraging home ownership. Now, again, you know, uh, you know from, from purely 30,000 feet, you can't criticize this policy, but it's in the practice of it, in the details of it, where things get out of hand, as we all know, these you know, no, no income uh, loans, you know, you know, you, you know you, the whole alphabet city of loans that were made to people who couldn't afford them and should never have taken them out in the first place. But basically, money was being thrown at them. There was basically 62% of the people in this country were homeowners until the Clintons came around. And, and they decided that uh, homeownership, as I said, was a good thing. And they pushed it. And by the end of, uh, you know, the Bush administration, we had something like... 67% of people in this country were homeowners. That five percentage point difference was something like three or four million new homeowners. People who had been renters once upon a time and were basically happy being renters were now uh, uh, homeowners. And for them, although I don't, think it, I don't think they thought of it this way, it was a free option. If people are going to give me all this money, basically free, and if I can uh, participate in the American dream by owning a home, and, and if I can pay the mortgage payments, great. If I can't, I'll, I'll give in the keys, and I'll be a renter again, just like I was before. But if they're telling me it's a good thing and I should do it, then I, why not? I'm, a, I'm an American. I'm going to do it. So you had that problems with the public policy, and then you combine, combine that with the Fed's decision after 9-11, Alan Greenspan's decision after 9-11, to dramatically lower interest rates relatively quickly. Within a year, uh, roughly, interest rates went, the Fed rates went from about 6% down to 1%. By the way, now they're even lower, which is a whole other subject, and, and we could be uh, creating a yet another bubble, very much like the one we just come out of. But the combination of pushing home ownership, putting all these mortgages out there that were then bought by Wall Street firms, 
who, you know, who had latched onto this great idea that Lou Ranieri had. And one thing you can be sure of about Wall Street is whether it's Michael Milken or Lou Ranieri, when somebody comes up with a great idea, the rest of Wall Street deconstructs it and tries to figure out as quickly as possible how they can make money from it so that you know, the Lou Ranieri's and the Solomon Brothers of the world and the Drexel Burnham's of the world don't make all the money. And so you've got this extraordinary development where, where people are, you know, buying up all these mortgages that are being printed faster than they can be, you know, made, and packaging them up into mortgage-backed securities, getting the rating agencies to rate them AAA. And by the way, they are a huge culprit in this, and what everybody forgets is that the rating agencies were paid by Wall Street to get the ratings that they wanted, so that they could slap these ratings on, on these uh, securities and sell them off to investors around the world who A, had gotten lazy and forgot to do their homework and forgot what it meant to take risks. And by the way, we're looking for yield because interest yield, you know, looking for a place to put their money to get a better yield than they could you know, in treasury securities, which thanks to Greenspan, had, the interest rates had been lowered on so dramatically. So you have these, you know, three pieces of the puzzle in a nice stew, but they'd be nothing if it weren't for my favorite reason, which is, of course, greed and short-sightedness. And you can't have a good crisis without that. And uh, Wall Street's got that in, in abundance, I'm glad, glad to say. And uh, Bear Stearns had it uh, uh, in abundance as well. And this is where my friend Jimmy Kane comes in. Now, uh, you know, I've talked so far in sort of uh, dry clinical uh, terms about uh, how this all, all came about, but but you know this isn't what the book is about. The book is really about the people who who worked at Bear Stearns and uh, and the kind of people they were and, and what they experienced as this crisis was developing and how they built this firm and how they made it what it was. And no one was more central to that than Jimmy Kane. And Jimmy Kane was literally, if I may uh, use this expression, uh, north of Hollywood, uh, right out of central casting. He, he was uh, uh, born uh, on the north side of uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, his, uh, his father was a patent attorney. And I knew I was in trouble with Jimmy when I met him and started interviewing him when he complained to me that uh, he was very disappointed in his father because his father only made as much as $75,000 a year and I'm thinking this is 1940, 1950, and you're complaining about your father making $75,000 a year. I think that was a small fortune back then. And he was a very successful patent attorney, but Jimmy had no interest in that. Uh, Jimmy uh, went to Purdue, uh, dropped out of Purdue before he got his, uh, uh, he could graduate. Uh, by then, he uh, had already uh, taken up basically playing bridge full time instead of uh, concentrating on his studies. Uh, uh, and he actually became a bridge player of some renown, uh, uh, even uh, while he was in college and just after college. And he did his stint in the army, and then he came back uh, and got married uh, and worked for his father-in-law, who was a scrap iron salesman, uh, one of the biggest scrap iron businesses uh, in Chicago. Uh, and then even after he divorced his wife, uh, he kept working for his father-in-law in the scrap iron business, which I think you know, has to be one of the very few times that uh, a, a divorced son-in-law kept working for a father-in-law uh, in, you know, in the annals of, of business history. But what Jimmy really wanted to do, well, he, the first thing he told me he wanted to do uh, was to become a bookie. That was his aspiration in life. And uh, he tells me that he didn't succeed at that, but I actually I think, I think he did. I think he ended up becoming a bookie uh, at Bear Stearns, uh, uh, but he didn't realize it. Uh, but what he really wanted to do uh, was to go to New York and become a professional bridge player. So that's exactly what he did. He left his uh, wife and two kids behind. They moved to Springfield, Illinois. Uh, uh, she remarried. He came to New York, uh, became a bridge player, and used to hang out in the bridge clubs that then were uh, populating uh, the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And, and, I, and I like to say that, that uh, bridge was sort of like the Facebook of its time. It was a social networking uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for people who worked on Wall Street. And so Jimmy Kane, uh, hoping to make like $500 a week uh, uh, at playing bridge, if he were lucky, uh, met all these Wall Street uh, titans, people like Larry Tisch, who was the single largest uh, investor in Wall Street and, and uh, ended up owning CBS for a time and Lowe's Corporation. And Jimmy played bridge with him. And he played bridge with Warren Buffett. And he played bridge with Bill Gates. And... Um, uh, finally, he met the woman who would become his second wife, and she insisted 
uh, at the bridge club, and she insisted that either he get a real job or he get a new girlfriend. And so he decided to use the connections that he'd been made playing bridge to get interviews at Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, and Bear Stearns. And when he was at Bear Stearns, um, he met a guy named Ace Greenberg, uh, who was from Oklahoma, whose father uh, had uh, had a series of women's clothing stores in Oklahoma, and who came to uh, New York to get a job on Wall Street, ended up at Bear Stearns, and was the heir apparent to the senior partner uh, of Bear Stearns at that time named Cy Lewis. And when Jimmy met uh, Ace Greenberg, uh, he was the heir apparent uh, to Cy, and uh, they hit it off immediately because Ace Greenberg knew about Jimmy Kane's bridge playing prowess. And Ace Greenberg himself was an aspiring bridge player and wanted Jimmy Kane to teach him how to play bridge better. So that's why Ace hired him at Bear Stearns. And Jimmy had you know, no uh, real knowledge of Wall Street or how it worked. He had been a municipal bond salesman for a couple hours a day uh, prior you know, to going to the bridge clubs. But he became a broker at Bear Stearns. And he ended up getting Larry Tisch as his client and was a successful broker at Bear Stearns. But what he really was, was, of course, uh, a very expert at managing his own career, managing upward. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in, in, of course, when you play bridge, you have to know where the cards are on the table that can hurt you. And Jimmy knew, he was very good at knowing where the cards, where the people were at the firm who could help him. Uh, you know, get to the top of the firm, and the people who could hurt him. The people who could hurt him, he eliminated summarily, and the people who, get, who could help him, he promoted them, and they promoted him until he got to the top of the firm. And he took over the firm from Ace Greenberg in 1993, in basically a, a coup d'etat. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about a coup d'etat is, you know, if you're going to do it, you've got to get rid of the previous king, make sure he's out of the picture, make sure that his head is is on the guillotine floor, is on the floor by the guillotine. But with Ace Greenberg, he didn't do that. He kept Ace around, and in fact, Ace remained on the executive committee of Bear Stearns until the very end. In fact, Ace is the only member of the Bear Stearns senior management who's still at J.P. Morgan Chase now. And, but what Jimmy Cain did, unfortunately, for Bear Stearns is that he uh, didn't really understand the business that Bear was in which was the fixed income business. He had been a broker. He didn't understand how it worked. Uh, and over time, he got completely intoxicated by the profits that that part of the business generated. And when he took over the firm in 1993, Bear's stock was around 33 bucks a share. It had gone public at 25 in 1985. And now eight years later, it had appreciated all the way to $33 a share. In January of 2007, when it reached its peak, Bear Stearns stock was at $172.69. The firm was worth like $20 billion. Jimmy Kane was the only CEO in Wall Street at that time who was worth a billion dollars in his own stock. And Jimmy Kane, who didn't graduate from Purdue, was quite proud of that fact and was very happy to lord that over the other Wall Street CEOs. And you, I don't know if you remember or not, but in there was a crisis that I didn't mention that occurred in 1998, 1999, involving long-term capital management, a hedge fund, and uh, Bear Stearns had, was the clearing bank for the hedge fund. This is a crisis that almost brought down the world's financial system again, but unlike this time, that time, the Wall Street banks got together to rescue long-term capital management, and so a crisis was avoided. This time, you'll note that the Wall Street banks did not get together to solve the crisis, and so we had a crisis. But Jimmy Kane refused, and Bear Stearns refused, to participate in the bailing out of long-term capital management. He, he alone on Wall Street said no. And so that when he was worth a billion dollars in his own stock and the rest of Wall Street was not, and they had snubbed him and were very angry at him for not, I can assure you he was very content and happy with all of his decision making and uh, didn't question any of that. Uh, and lorded it over the other Wall Street CEOs. And so Jimmy was so confident and so filled with hubris about his decision-making prowess, even though he didn't really understand the kind of business that Bear Stearns was in and how it made its money and the profits that it was making and how it did that and the risks it was taking, that, that, that he engaged in a, a humongous amount of short-sightedness. He failed to diversify the firm. He had chances to buy uh, Neuberger Berman, an asset management business, 
that Lehman eventually bought. He could have bought it and added to Bayer's uh, tiny asset management business. He didn't do it. He could have uh, uh, expanded the investment banking business to, to smooth out some of the rough edges of the fixed income business, and he didn't do that. He could have expanded overseas into Europe, and he didn't do that. He could have uh, bought a business called Pershing, which is a clearing business that Donaldson, Lufkin, Jenrette was selling after that firm was sold to First Boston. And, he, and it would have been a perfect fit with his business, and he didn't do that. He could have done any number of things to diversify his firm, and he didn't do it. And why didn't he do it? He didn't do it because the executive committee at Bear Stearns was paid based on a return on equity calculation. And that's just fancy Wall Street talk for generating as much profit as you possibly can, using as little capital as you have to to do it. Had Jimmy bought these other firms, or diversified the business, or done any of these other things, that ratio of profits to capital would have changed, would have been smaller. And his, he and his fellow four members on the, on the executive committee would have been paid less. He could have sold the firm. He had any number of opportunities to sell the firm. But any time anybody approached him, he always raised the bar to higher and higher levels so that uh, you know, everybody who was a potential buyer walked away. So you have the four strands of this DNA molecule, if you will, and I apologize to any scientists in the room because I know that that's not the way it really works, but give me poetic license here. You've got the transformation of these firms from private partnerships to public companies. You've got this, this focus on financial innovation when married with the new compensation structure on Wall Street, you know, allowed these firms to just become selling machines without consequence to what they were selling and having any accountability for what they were selling. You have public policy where home ownership was encouraged, interest rates were so low that this creation of mortgage-backed securities, as flawed as they were, were sold all around the world without regard to the quality of the underlying assets. And you have this bizarre set of greedy, short-sightedness behavior in the men, and mostly men, because that's the way Wall Street is, who were at the top of these firms. And by the way, this was the same thing that happened at, at Lehman Brothers, and the same thing that happened at, at Merrill Lynch, and the same thing that happened at all the firms that ran into serious trouble. It was this short-sightedness and the greed driven by the, the top management. But what really did, you know, so that all that would have been bad enough, but what really did Bear Stearns in that week of March, was the most extraordinary thing of all, which I had no idea about when I first started writing this book. And in fact, it's so absurd that, that I'm gonna to try to simplify it for you as best that I can. And it was such a revelation to me, even though I'd worked on Wall Street for 17 years. And that is how Wall Street financed itself. How Bear Stearns financed itself. Bear Stearns financed itself in what was called the overnight repo market. Now, I know you don't understand what that is, and I didn't understand what that was until I dug into it a little bit. But what it means is that they financed themselves with people who lent them money on an overnight basis using as collateral some assets on their balance sheet. So every night, Bear Stearns needed $75 billion from this overnight financing market to finance their business. You know, they had $18 billion in cash on their balance sheet, which sure seems like a lot of money to me. But it wasn't enough because they needed $75 billion a night to finance their business. And that last week of, of March of its existence, as the rumors began flying, you know, that were exacerbated by CNBC, the 24-7, you know, loop of these crazy people getting on there and, and, and spouting off and rumors that were circulating in the market. And oh, by the way, if you asked a banker on Wall Street how, you know, Macy's should finance itself, or Northrop Grumman should finance itself, or Boeing should finance itself, they would never, ever, ever recommend to one of their clients that their clients finance themselves in the overnight repo market. It's just, why in the world would you give a creditor in the overnight market a vote on whether you should stay in existence from one day to the next? Why did Bear Stearns do this? They would never recommend to their clients to do this. They did it in part because of this return on equity calculation, this greed, this way that these guys were compensated. They were compensated to generate as high profits as they possibly could using as little capital as they had needed to do it. 
if you are financing your business in the overnight repo market, you are paying very, very little each night for that money. If you go into the long-term debt financing markets like real companies do, that financing costs a lot more. Your profits would have been a lot lower. Well, I don't think Jimmy Cain really understood this, but the CFO of Bear Stearns understood this, and they decided to finance themselves in this overnight market. Well, what happened when the rumors started flying fast and furious and people started taking their money out of the firm and credit rating agencies started getting nervous, these overnight lenders, people like Fidelity and Federated Investors, people who had been doing this for the previous 20 years at Bear Stearns every night, and Paul Friedman, my friend from the beginning of this story who told me that we did this to, them, to, to ourselves, Paul Friedman was in charge of the repo desk at Bear Stearns, and every night he would go to the repo guys and make sure that you know, the repo lenders were rolling over their money every night. And this worked beautifully for 20 years, until this week of March when it no longer worked. And one after another that week, day after day in that final week, they all said, no, we're not going to take the risk of lending you this money on an overnight basis. And, and why did they suddenly get so frightened about doing business with Bear Stearns? because the collateral that they were using for these overnight loans were the very mortgage-backed securities that Bear Stearns was in the business of manufacturing and selling. And by March of 2008, as we all know, many mortgage lenders had failed. You couldn't get these no-doc loans anymore. These securities began losing value very rapidly in the market. And these overnight lenders didn't want that collateral as security for these overnight loans. They just said, forget it. We, we don't know what these things are worth. There's no market for them, and we're not going to take the risk. You can't pay us enough to take the risk, so we're not going to do it. Well, as the French say, les jeux sont faits. The jig was up after that moment, and, and Bear Stearns, which needed $75 billion a night to finance itself, had only $18 billion uh, on its balance sheet, and the numbers don't, just, don't add up no matter what you do, and it was a classic you know, Jimmy Stewart-like run on the bank. So it was the combination of these five things that did in our friends at Bear Stearns. And oh, by the way, it was the same thing that happened at Lehman. Different personalities, but the same dynamics. I could have been talking about Lehman just as easily as talking about Bear. Same thing happened at Merrill Lynch. Same thing almost happened at Morgan Stanley. And the same thing almost happened at Goldman Sachs. One thing is for sure, Wall Street will never be the same. There really is no Wall Street anymore. What we used to think of as Wall Street securities firms are either out of existence or have become bank holding companies. And, uh, you know, we're still trying to come to the terms with that. So before I end and we get to the panel, I, I do have to just tell you a little bit of stuff out of school because it's, it's too much fun. Uh, and that involves J Jimmy Kane, who really, I, I have to tell you, uh, the book wouldn't have been the same, and I don't think nearly as readable or, or as fun or as successful without him, you know, literally you know, opening up a vein and pouring it all out to me. And I'm not quite sure what he was thinking, but I'm glad he did. Uh, he hasn't done this with anybody else, and I'm glad he did it with me. Uh, so uh, uh, literally the, the day um, that of the shareholder meeting at Bear Stearns, which was uh, uh, May uh, 28th or 29th of 2008, I'd been trying to get in touch with Jimmy to talk to him, obviously, uh, and I'd had no success until uh, the day of that shareholder vote. And uh, I, um, the shareholder meeting, by the way, was for investors only. No, no journalists allowed, no reporters allowed. Now, as Art said, uh, he may have mentioned in, in the introduction that uh, uh, not only did I go to journalism school, but I also went to Columbia Business School. And uh, I figured, well, uh, I'm going to take off my journalist hat to, to see if I can, because you know, I can't go to the meeting as a journalist, but let's see if I can go as, uh, as an investor. So about a week before the shareholder vote, I went and bought 10 shares of Bear Stearns stock, and I actually made money on it. And I went to the shareholder meeting as a shareholder of Bear Stearns. And uh, I went to the meeting, and I, of course, it was uh, incredibly uh, moving, dramatic, even though, you know, even I, you know, who had no ties to the firm at all, I mean, it was very moving, and Jimmy Kane was very sad and, uh, uh, you know, started lashing out at Goldman Sachs and conspiracy theories and all of this. It was very interesting. Uh, and then uh, right after that, I found myself up in his office where he was carrying on and having a, 
having a great time. It was sort of like maybe an Irish wake or something. I mean, it was really amazing. People were coming in uh, left and right and uh, uh, talking to him and um, until, and he was sort of having a great time until Jamie Dimon uh, called from Italy, uh, Jamie Dimon being the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, who had just bought his company, and Jimmy straightened up and basically said to Jamie Dimon, you know, good luck to you, uh, you know, I hope you can make a go of it. And uh, that was the first time I, 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 I spoke to Jimmy, and that le led to about, uh, you know, 10 other meetings and about 30 hours of uh, fully transcribed, taped interviews. So, um, in and around uh, August of uh, 2008, uh, uh, Bear was still the only firm that had imploded, you know, Fannie, Freddie, Lehman, AIG, Merrill, they were all to come in the next few weeks. I had agreed to go see Jimmy. Uh, I'd basically been meeting Jimmy at his apartment in New York, uh, but I'd basically gone, uh, agreed to go see him uh, at his uh, summer house on the coast of New Jersey in a town called Deal, New Jersey, which I just love the fact that this you know, card shark, uh, Jimmy Kane, uh, had a home in Deal, New Jersey, which was, by the way, you know, at the turn of the century, a very popular spot for Wall Streeters before the Hamptons uh, came into vogue. And uh, I had written uh, an article in Fortune magazine that came out in August, that same day that I was going to see Jimmy, uh, that basically was the first time uh, that Jimmy had, uh, you know, through, through me and through this article, was going to explain to everybody who cared to read the article, uh, you know, his version of events and how they happened and why. It was sort of a, a curtain raiser for the book and a prelude to what would eventually uh, be coming out uh, in much more detail in the book. And uh, I thought to myself, well, I have this uh, meeting with Jimmy already scheduled. And, uh, you know, he, he knows what's basically going to come out in the article. He knows uh, 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 the quotes that I'm going to use. And, you know, I'm pretty, you know, I'm good with it. I mean, he's not, he's not going to be mad at me. It's going to be fine. Uh, he knows what's coming. And so uh, I'm going to keep this appointment. And I drove the 90 minutes uh, to his house in Deal, New Jersey. And uh, previously when I'd met Jimmy, uh, he'd greet me at the door of his apartment. And then he uh, uh, would go, you know, he has this big apartment and this big house, but he liked to be in a very small room in the apartment and in the house, uh, what he calls the womb. And it was this dark room where he, you know, can draw the shades. He's got CNBC going and Charlie Gasparino going yelling at him. And he's smoking his $140 cigars and whatever else he's smoking. And... Uh, uh, this is where he likes to be. And so when I'd come uh, and visit him as an apartment, we'd go into this room and I'd be almost asphyxiated by the cigar smoke. Uh, he, he, I loved it. He, he drank cranberry juice at the same time that he's smoking cigars so that he was thinking that you know, one would balance out the other and for health purposes, I guess. So I knew that uh, when I got down to Deal, New Jersey, a uh, big house, and uh, he doesn't greet me at the door and I'm thinking, now nah, I've got some tr trouble here. Uh, but I get shown back to the womb, which is a long way because it's such a big house. And I get there, and he greets me. Uh, you know, I walk in, and he doesn't really say much. And he's, he's uh, wearing a polo shirt buttoned all the way to the top. He's wearing white slacks and Gucci loafers, smoking his big cigar. And I'm thinking, am I, am I in New Jersey or am I in Miami Beach? Uh, I wasn't sure exactly. Maybe I'd gotten uh, lost along the way. Uh, and I thought, uh, you know, he doesn't seem to be greeting me very warmly. And uh, I say, hey, Jimmy, what's going on? And he just sort of looks at me. And I said, is, is everything okay? And he looks at me and he goes like this, uh, two, two thumbs down. And I'm thinking, what is he talking about? Where's he going with this? And uh, he says to me, he says, I, I, I got to tell you, he says, this is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. And I'm thinking, what, what is he talking about? I mean, here's a guy whose firm has, you know, imploded. He's lost a billion dollars in his own stock. His 14,000 Bear Stearns employees are out of work or struggling to find work. He's, he's virtually, you know, the laughing stock of Wall Street because his firm has imploded. And again, it's before all the others did. And he's telling me that this, this article that you wrote is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And he said, he said that already by the time that I'd gotten there, 15 people had called him up and told him, how could you let this guy do this to you? This is, this is incredible. And I'm thinking, I gotta get out of here and I gotta get out of here fast. <laughs> he says to me, sit down. We're gonna go through this line by line. I'm thinking, oh God, I gotta get out of here. 
I started the piece by talking about how Jimmy had almost died, which is true. Jimmy did almost die. Uh, in September of 2007, uh, he had uh, uh, left from a private uh, airport near, near Deal, New Jersey on a private jet uh, to China. And he had gone to China to try to do uh, a, a stock swap with a Chinese investment bank. Uh, and the idea was that uh, Bear Stearns would invest a billion dollars in them, and they would invest a billion dollars in Bear Stearns. And remember what I told you about that return on equity calculation? It wasn't real capital coming in, so that return on equity calculation wouldn't change, so we wouldn't have to worry about that. But it sort of had the appearance of, you know, new, new equity coming into the firm, which uh, in September of 07, people were already beginning to talk, talk about because these securities were losing value and there was going to have to be write-downs. And Jimmy told me that uh, when, when he went on this mission, which was a secret mission that nobody knew about, that uh, we had flown under the radar and over the polar ice caps to China. And while he was there, he actually, uh, he'd, he'd been to China quite often because he was a bridge player and he used to play bridge with the Chinese leaders. And uh, uh, he would tell me all about playing bridge with them. Uh, and when he got back from this trip, which was actually successful, they did announce the deal, although it never closed because uh, Bear Stearns imploded before it could close. Uh, he, he was uh, soon thereafter rushed to the hospital uh, with a uh, sepsis infection, which is a urinary tract infection, and I won't go into detail on it, but suffice it to say, this is something men don't want, uh, and nobody wants, and it's very painful. And, uh, but they didn't announce this to the uh, public. He's the CEO of a public company, and they did not announce this. He was taken away, not in an ambulance, but in a black sedan, to New York Hospital from his apartment on Park Avenue. And he was basically out of uh, of the office for a month without anybody knowing about it at, by the way, a very crucial time. So in this article, uh, the lead of this article, I had written that he almost died, which is true, uh, and that he was out of the, uh, the office for a month, and um, this was the first time that this was going to be revealed. Now the other thing that I wrote uh, was that he had lost 30 pounds when he was in the hospital. Uh, now now, now 99,999 times out of 100,000, if you ask somebody uh, if they can speak to your doctor, because you're writing a book about them, and you want to write about a serious illness that they've had, uh, they will say no. I guarantee it. I promise you they will say no. Jimmy Cain is that one exception who said yes. You can go talk to my doctor, which I thought was absolutely extraordinary. Now, at this time, Jimmy was 74 years old. His doctor was in his 80s. And his doctor was one of these sort of Park Avenue types, very, you know, uh, studious, uh, very reputable. Uh, and I went and saw him, and he pulled out the, the Jimmy Kane file, and he dusted it off, and it's like that Seinfeld episode where, where, you know, Elaine is worried about her medical file, and their doctors are constantly writing all the notes on the medical file. So this medical file has lots of notes uh, all about Jimmy Kane, and in that conversation, he tells me all the illnesses that Jimmy's had, which were extraordinary, and I won't bore you with them. Uh, but he also told me how Jimmy Kane came, came into the hospital at one weight and went out at the other. And being a Columbia Business School graduate, I subtracted one number from the other and got to 30. And so this was the number that I put in the article. So when Jimmy tells me to sit down, we're going to go through this line by line, the first thing that he says to me, he says, what is this, I lost 30 pounds in the hospital. I didn't lose 30 pounds in the hospital. And I'm thinking to myself, this is what, this is number one on his list? This is what he's so upset about, that I said that he'd lost 30 pounds in the hospital? I said, Jimmy, remember, you know, I, I talked to your doctor, I went in, he talked me through all this, he said, you came in at this weight, went out at that weight, and I, and I subtracted one number from the other, and I got 30 pounds. I said, Jimmy, come on, you, you know, what's the, there's no issue here. He said, no, no, I didn't lose 30 pounds in the hospital. I said, Jimmy, I think you did. He said, no. Everybody's going to think I was fat. <laughs> and there was a list of 25 things, by the way, uh, but I'm only going to tell you one more. And that is, I also wrote that he had maneuvered his way to the top of Bear Stearns. Now, I worked on Wall Street for 17 years. Uh, this was my second book about Wall Street. I, I guess I'm a student of... Wall Street ethics, Wall Street mores, Wall Street behavior, Wall Street power plays. And I think that by describing what Jimmy did as maneuvering his way to the top of Bear Stearns was very kind. I didn't write that he had kneecapped anybody who'd gotten remotely close 
to him in terms of power. I didn't write that he had fired Warren Spector, who was the head of fixed income and the co-president of the firm with Alan Schwartz in August of 2007. Why did he fire Warren Spector? Because Warren Spector himself was also a National Bridge champion. And by the way, this is the double or triple entendre on the title of the book, House of Cards. Jimmy and, and uh, uh, Warren had both been playing at a National Bridge tournament in Nashville, Tennessee in July of 2007. Now, that probably means nothing to you all, but in, in July of 2007, the two Bear Stearns hedge funds had blown up in June of 2007 and were liquidated in July of 2007. You would think that the senior management of the firm would not be playing bridge at a National Bridge tournament during all of this, but, but they were. And by the way, when you play at these National Bridge tournaments, you're basically incommunicado for a week to 10 days. And why did uh, Jimmy fire Warren? Well, probably he fired him because he, Warren should have been uh, in New York managing the hedge fund crisis, which reported to him rather than playing bridge. But he also fired him because he thought that he had an agreement with, with Warren that they both wouldn't be playing bridge at the same tournament at the same time and that Warren had defied him on that. And oh, by the way, Warren was doing better in the tournament than Jimmy. So Jimmy comes back and he fires Warren. And you know, this is why I love Jimmy Kane. This is why I love writing about Wall Street. This is why the subtitle of the book is a, 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 a tale of hubris and wretched excess on Wall Street. Because without missing a beat, to the answer to my question of what word he would have used instead of manuvad, he said, ascended. You should have written that I ascended to the top of Bear Stearns. So that's my little theory on how this all happened and why. And uh, I'm happy to move on to the question part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the speech now. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bill's story is to learn how to play bridge. Uh, let's ask if you have a question from the audience, if you write it down on the card and bring it over to the aisles and maybe some of the ushers or some of our staff can bring them up here. But we'll start with the panel. And let me first introduce the panel. Uh, Craig Smith, uh, a longtime faculty member here at Long Beach State, former trustee of the CSU system, former speechwriter for President Ford, and prolific author. Uh, Craig, welcome to our panel. Uh, uh, Mr. Chavez is the president of the Associated Students here on campus, and we're delighted to have Chris on our panel. And uh, my boss, uh, Dean Mike Salt, dean of the College of Business. So uh, let's give the panel a little hand, and we'll start with the panel. And Craig, you've been on our panel all three years, so let's, let's start with you. Okay. Um, the, one of the most fascinating things you talked about was this repo business and how they finance themselves with $75 billion. If that is not regulated, and if regulators do not catch that, uh, and if there aren't regulations to catch it, what kind of regulation should we have that would catch it? You know, I, I, I guess I don't think that this is a matter for regulation. You know, just because Bear Stearns did it this way and Lehman did it this way, uh, because they were uh, probably short-term greedy, you know, uh, let, let's just take the example of Goldman Sachs. Now, you know, I, I'm not an apologist for Goldman Sachs. As I mentioned, I'm writing a book about them, and I'm sure they'll get the Bill Cohen treatment that both Lazard and Bear Stearns got, but you have to give them credit for not uh, making themselves vulnerable through this short-term financing in the same way that Bear Stearns did. And I asked the uh, co-president of Goldman Sachs, a guy named Gary Cohn, why that was. Why did, you know, they had much more long-term debt and it cost them a lot more money and their profits were lower, as hard as that may be to imagine, with Goldman Sachs, uh, a lot lower as a result. They could have made a lot more money uh, by financing themselves in the short-term repo market. They chose to finance themselves more prudently through long-term financing because, as they said, they are long-term greedy. 
not short-term <laughs> greedy. And, and, and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's why they're, that's primarily why they're still around and Bear and Lehman and Merrill are not, because they were all much too exposed to the short-term financing markets. And I, I spent a lot of time talking to Tim Geithner, who at that time was our uh, head of the New York Fed and now our, our Treasury Secretary, and he was aware of the risks uh, that these firms were taking in the short-term financing markets. And it's always easy uh, in, in, in hindsight, hindsight is 2020, to, to realize that how big a problem that was. Uh, you know, the, the thing is that this short-term repo market had worked, uh, you know, very well for 20 years. And part of the failure here in this crisis was a failure of imagination. Nobody could even conceive of the fact that the short-term financing markets wouldn't operate properly in this crisis. But, you know, if you think about it, we have this capital market system in this country, which is the, the heart and soul of capitalism, that depends upon the confidence that we placed in the system. Because without that confidence, you see how vulnerable these firms are. I mean, nobody could have conceived at how, of how vulnerable these firms were to this loss of confidence. And it's because of this short-term financing. So I think they got the message, but I'm sure over time that they'll go back to it because it's so cheap. It kind of reminds me of the Titanic that people thought was unsinkable. Very much so. It's, it's a, very much a lack of imagination. Dean Mike Salt, welcome. Thank you, Art. Um, um, back in um, late uh, 2008, one of the CNBC commentators, Rick Santelli, uh, was, went on sort of a rant. And he was talking about uh, government is promoting bad behavior. Uh, do we really want to subsidize the losers' mortgages? This is America. How many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage? President Obama, are you listening? How about we all stop paying our mortgages? It's moral hazard. He got lots of cheers from all the traders in the pit that day. Uh, he called for a new Tea Party and supported capitalism. Um, so now, uh, I guess if you, if you follow what he is saying, he's saying that the government should leave the market alone, the market will correct itself, sorting out the winners and losers. Economic agents should bear the consequences of their decisions and should not expect to be bailed out. Otherwise, this country will slide into socialism. Pure capitalism should rule in that view. Do we need regulation and bailouts? And if so, how much and for how long? Yeah, well, Rick created quite a name for himself there for a week or so as a result of that <laughs> rant. Um, so I've, I've given this a lot of thought uh, you know, in the writing of the book, and since I, I, I've published the book, and other books have been published, and, and I've learned a lot, especially from uh, uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin's book, Too Big to Fail, which I, I, I recommend to you uh, as well. Um, and I guess now I've come to the point where I think that while I wouldn't have had as good a story to tell, I think that they should have let Bear Stearns fail. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, yes, we need regulation because what we've seen in the last 20 years, 25 years, is that sort of this tendency towards uh, uh, hands-off, laissez-faire uh, behavior with, with, with the, you know, with Wall Street and securities firms and repeal of Glass-Steagall and failure to, you know, the SEC uh, uh, put into place new regulations in June of 2004 that, that allowed these firms to leverage themselves up far beyond what they'd done previously. And the quid pro quo for that was that they were going to regulate them more closely and have actual people from the SEC in these, in these firms monitoring what they did. Unfortunately, they forgot to do that part. Uh, and so the first time the SEC was at Bear Stearns was in that same August 2007 weekend when Jimmy Kane fired Warren for playing bridge. Uh, KKR was in there thinking about putting an equity investment in the firm, and in the third room what was uh, the SEC regulators for the first time since this regulation was put in in June 2004. So that is, you know, that's crazy, right? Uh, but, you know, the, the more I think about it, had they let Bear Stearns fail, had they not bailed out the creditors, had they not given shareholders $2 and then $10 a share, the market would have gotten a loud signal and message that, you're on your own, we're not gonna help you, you're not too big to fail, 
you're not systemically important, and uh, I assure you that at that moment, Merrill Lynch would have done what was necessary, Lehman Brothers would have done what was necessary, and we wouldn't have had this regulatory arbitrage, this guessing game about whether Paulson was going to bail us out or not. And uh, unfortunately, that's what happened as a result. So Dick Fold at Lehman thought he could, you know, was going to get the bailout. He put all his chips on the bailout, and he guessed wrong. I, had, had, had Bear Stearns gone down, Dick Fold would have figured out very quickly he had to sell his firm or you know, do what he did six months too late, six months earlier. So I wouldn't have had as good a story, but I think uh, that would have been better for the rest of us, for everyone else. Chris, uh, you're the president of the Associated Students, and uh, this meltdown has uh, substantially impacted students with 30% raises in your student fees, tougher to get classes. Uh, how do you and your generation view this whole episode? Well, frankly, uh, this for a lot of students came as a large surprise because we grew up hearing about these firms, about these Vaughan firms, about, you know, I remember one time joking uh, a couple months before the collapse, I was saying, well, we'll know things are bad when Washington Mutual goes. Uh, so, and it's, and I think there's a, a, a disconnect, not, not, not uh, necessarily by choice, but I think a cultural disconnect between what these firms actually do and how many people know that the Dow Jones Industrial Composite is just a collection of the relative value of 30 companies. 30 companies out of the entire United States economy. But we act as if the Dow Jones is everything and the end all be all, be -all of the U.S. economy. So I think it's, it was a rude awakening call for many people, particularly my generation, because we're in a situation where we're starting to have to think about what retirement, when retirements, how we're going to provide for ourselves once we get older, so. Thank you. Bill, um, uh, let's talk for a moment about uh, the role of government uh, or, or the lack of the role of government. Uh, uh, many feel that uh, the SEC and others were kind of uh, asleep at the switch, and greed is nothing new for Wall Street. Greed's been around forever, and even criminal behavior has been around forever, but shouldn't government have a regulatory complex that, that stops this from happening or at least stops companies from getting too big to, why should any company in America be too big to fail? Uh, no company should be too big to fail. I mean, uh, and uh, I think uh, for the good of the system, we have to let uh, companies, that's why we have bankruptcy courts, that's why we have bankruptcy laws, that's why we have reorganizations, uh, and, you know, it's not pretty, but capitalism often isn't pretty. I mean, the, the economist jo Joseph Schumpeter wrote about creative destructionism as being a key tenet of capitalism, and, and, and sometimes you just have to let, you know, the, 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 for the forces of excess and human nature, I mean, this isn't the first time, this is like the thousandth time that this has happened, but, but you know, if you don't, uh, you know, you, you, can't, you can't control human nature, uh, you shouldn't try, but, you know, you, you do have to let the system work, otherwise people aren't going to learn, or they're going to get the wrong message. I mean, actually, I, I, you know, people talk about how, uh, what, what a horrible thing it was for Lehman Brothers to fail, but I actually, um, I don't really look at it that way. I look at it as, um, and, and I think the governor of your state would appreciate this uh, metaphor, uh, like that villain in, in, in Terminator 2 <laughs> that, 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 that's made of sort of liquid uh, mercury or whatever the guy's made of, and, you know, he gets cannons shot through him and bazookas shot through him, and he... He, he, he melts down, he liquidates uh, and liquefies and reformulates as some horrible new villain again. And, and, and he goes on. That's, that's what, where am I going with this, what you're wondering? That's what happened uh, with Lehman Brothers. And, you know, Lehman Brothers, you know, melted down, but, you know, all the pieces sort of got by. You know, Barclays brought the investment banking business in the U.S., Nomura bought the investment banking business in Europe, Newberger Berman is on its own now, the private equity guys are on its own. You know, th then, then, by the way, there's the uh, 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 carcass of the company, uh, the Lehman Brothers Holding, which is in bankruptcy, uh, where these lawyers and bank bankers are uh, uh, you know, sucking up uh, hundreds of millions of fees you know, annually to, to sustain this thing. If this company had all these resources, what was it doing you know, in bankruptcy in the first place? So I think you have to, you know, it was, it was a good thing. I think that we began to get better, as hard as it may seem, when Lehman Brothers was allowed uh, to fail. They, as I say, they should have let Bear Stearns fail. 
uh, sooner, I think people would have gotten the message. So on the one hand, I think, yes, you have to let the markets do their thing without government intervention. Uh, on, on the other hand, you do have to, there are plenty of regulations on the books. They need to be enforced. So it's not the lack of regulations. It's not it's the lack. The existing it's, ones were right. not properly enforced. And, and, you know, and to some extent, it's not a fair fight, as we were talking about before. I mean, Wall Street exists to evade uh, the regulations that it helps write. Uh, these people get paid millions of dollars uh, to do that. And uh, you know, you've got regulators who make you know, a fraction of that who don't have the resources. Uh, you know, it doesn't help when you have a congressman from just south of here who uh, I think was busy surfing the whole time when he should have been uh, regulating and head of the SEC. Uh, he was completely asleep at the switch, and I'm sorry for all those Christopher Cox supporters out there, but there's a guy who has never come forward to explain what the heck he was doing there the whole time. Yeah. Again, we invite uh, any of you in the audience to have a question just to write it down and pass it over. And uh, Craig, why don't you uh, take another shot, and we'll get some questions from the yeah, audience. Yeah, I, I, I've got a question about what seems to me right now an anomaly, and that is uh, productivity is up. We're back to about 6% annually. We're very good at productivity. Uh, the market's back up over 10,000. But unemployment isn't back. Have we reached a point where we have an economy that's going to be very productive, where we're going to have growth in the GDP and everything else, and we're never going to get back to 4% unemployment? The, the, the so-called jobless recovery scenario. Yeah. No, I, I think that the reason that uh, unemployment, uh, first of all, uh, I, I had a, an article uh, in, in this month's Vanity Fair about Larry Summers, uh, who is an interesting uh, fellow, and uh, uh, you know, I encourage you to, to read it. But one thing he talks about, and Tim Geithner talks about, is how, of course, and this is what economists talk about, is uh, uh, how uh, 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 jobs and job, new jobs are a lagging indicator, and the unemployment rate is going to get higher before it gets lower, and that's a lagging indicator. The, the truth of the matter is that they spend all this time and energy uh, trying to fix the top of the pyramid. It, it, this is like trickle-down economics part two. I mean, they've decided we need to fix Wall Street. We need to fix the engine room of capitalism. And I'm not saying they're wrong, but we, we're, you know, they've poured some $12 trillion into that engine room and to get it back on its feet again. And that's you know, in part why you see the Dow going from 6,500 to almost 11,000. That's why you see Goldman Sachs making record profits, because they have less competition. Uh, their cost of goods sold, i.e. Uh, capital, their rocket fuel, is cheap. I, I like to say that the airlines could make money, too, if, if the jet fuel was free. And, and uh, uh, so it's no secret they're making money. Uh, but they've made this decision, and they hope that by fixing the engine room of capitalism, that this will somehow trickle out to the rest of the economy. But the fact is that the jobs are created in this country by small businesses and new businesses and expanding businesses, and these small businesses and new businesses cannot get capital. They are choked off. It's, it's, it's just not working at the moment. And until that loosens up, and that, that, that has to do with risk, you know, that has to do with bankers willing to take risk again. You know, and once again, they, 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 they go from uh, a situation where they completely forget that, that there are risks to things and that there's no cost to risk to a situation where there's no price that you can put on, uh, on making risk available. So, uh, you know, Wall Street just goes through these crazy pendulums. And uh, until that uh, uh, fixes itself, and it probably will over time, we're going to be faced with increasing uh, uh, job losses. Uh, the scarier figure to me is the you know, 17 to 18 percent of the people who have either lost their jobs or have stopped looking for jobs, or the people who are, who, who, whose jobs have you know, been eliminated and there's no way to get anything like them you know, back again. I mean, people in, in, in some aspects of financial services or in the auto industries or these other industries, manufacturing, where, where these jobs are just gone. And, how do you, you know, if you're, you know, in middle age and you've been doing one thing your whole life, how do you reprogram yourself to, you know, you can't just, if I've been, you know, lathing furniture my whole life, how do I suddenly, you know, make uh, solar panels? I mean, that, that doesn't, that, that is a major problem. Bill, we have a couple of questions from the audience. On to, I'll give you three and you can combine them or whatever. Uh, several people wanted to know about 
Glass-Steagall, should we get, get back to that? Uh, another wanted to know, what do you think of Bank of America's purchase of Merrill Lynch? Oh. And third, uh, a rather macro question, is this the end of the American empire? Well, I've given a lot of thought to all three of those. Uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to be Mr. Gloom and Doom, but I, uh, I do, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I sometimes think about writing a book called 1963, uh, because uh, maybe it's because I'm from Massachusetts, but uh, you know, I think that something changed in the country uh, after November 1963, and uh, I, I just think That's uh, the, that would be the Kennedy assassination. Kennedy assassination. Yeah. And uh, I, I think we're sort of still struggling with, with that. I may, I may be totally wrong about that. Uh, and, you know, on the one hand, I think that the American uh, spirit is in, indomitable and, uh, you know, it's going to be, you know, get us out of this. And I think to some extent that's right. But I think we've also become a, a country of slitherers who don't like to take responsibility for their actions. And I think until we take responsibility for our actions, like not signing loan documents that are completely fictitious and, and you know, taking out money that we can't afford to pay back or, I mean, we're, you know, not a single Wall Street CEO has come forward to explain to the American people how this happened and why, I mean, you know, and, and what the role of Wall Street was in this. No one has re come forward to say thank you to the American taxpayer for bailing them out of this and, you know, making their personal fortunes be worth hundreds of millions of dollars again. You know, until we take responsibility for our actions, I think we as a country uh, are, are going to be flawed. That's just the way I feel. I mean, this country was not built on people uh, slithering away from responsibility. It was built on quite the opposite. So, so that's, that's that. As far as uh, you know, Glass-Steagall is concerned, uh, I think the repeal of Glass-Steagall made uh, de facto what was already de jour. In other words, that uh, it was already the fact that commercial banks were competing with investment banks. Uh, you know, it's like unscrambling the ed egg. Just like you're not going to make Goldman Sachs into a private partnership again, uh, I think there are ways uh, to, to uh, you know, get people to have more skin in the game. And, and while I wouldn't, you know, reinstitute Glass-Steagall, I feel very strongly that we need to get back to a time uh, as best we can uh, where the people, the top 100 people who are running these firms, who are making millions of dollars a year, who are making the decisions about where capital is deployed and what business is to be in, should have skin in the game again and should have their entire net worths on the line for their decisions that they make. And so I propose, I've proposed, I wrote this in a June uh, 2009, uh, incredible, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven, full page uh, editorial in the New York Times and on a sun, in the Sunday New York Times. Uh, I don't know what they were thinking by giving me that kind of uh, territory. Uh, but uh, in there, I proposed that uh, essentially a new uh, class of security at the bottom of these capital structures of these banks get created that represents the full net worth of these top 100 people, which is an arbitrary number, top 100 people at these firms, so that their full net worth was on the line for the decisions they were making. Now, you're never going to go back to the private partnerships again, but if their full net worths were on the line, then before they started engaging in selling these risky securities without accountability, if they knew that they were going to lose not only their billion-dollar fortune in the case of Jimmy Kane, but also the other $400 million that he had stashed away, he would have spent a lot more time, less time playing bridge and smoking pot, and a lot more time <laughs> focusing on the risks that Bear Stearns had. And what was the third one? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Got him. Chris? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of the firms that comprise the old Wall Street have disappeared or morphed into something more benign or not really. No, I didn't say more benign, but no. anyway. <laughs> morphed into morphed. something different. Yes. Uh, you all, and you also, um, but at the same time, the, 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 what I got is that the, even though, and you mentioned this, that we had this whole crisis, the same type of mindset is there, is yes. still in there, in the sense that it's still all about what's the bottom line, how am I going to look good in the magazines, how am I going to look good in Business Weekly or Forbes or whatever. So is that personality, is that mindset still fully entrenched in Wall Street? And if so, how at risk are we of suffering another situation like we're in now? 
Yes, the, the mindset is every bit as, as entrenched as ever. I, I don't think there's any uh, contrition. I don't think there's any uh, self-awareness about what's happened and why. I, I, I just think they're trying to get back to the status quo as quickly as possible. Uh, I think Rahm Emanuel is the one that said uh, you should never waste a good crisis. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, with the Dow at 6,500 in March, I really thought we were going to get some reforms of the system. But now that the Dow is close to 11,000 again, even though you're right, it doesn't represent uh, the broad economy and is just an indicator of 30 stocks, I, I, don't, I think we're losing the moment. And uh, for all we know, and, and I'm, you know, I, I can see signs of it already, we're, we're creating you know, another... Uh, asset bubble, another bubble, and you know we don't know. Well, one thing's for sure: uh, uh, it, it'll, it'll never be the same as it was. There will never be another crisis in mortgage-backed securities. That I promise you. There will never be uh, another crisis in high-yield securities. There will never be another crisis in internet IPOs. Wall Street is very good at fighting the last war. They, they do learn uh, a little bit from their mistakes in that. Uh, they're not going to repeat the same kind of things as before. But because of the compensation system, which hasn't changed one iota, I might add, despite the Steven Feinbergs of the world and, and all that talk, uh, you know, as long as bankers and traders on Wall Street are compensated uh, with huge millions of dollars of bonuses to sell and generate revenue, that's what they're, they're going to find out whatever the next new thing is, and they're going to sell it, and they're probably already, already selling it. We just don't know what it is. And until you have them put their skin in the game again, you, you know, yes, I think we're on the path to another such thing. I mean, again, I, I, it, it's not some great wisdom or insight. I mean, it's just that this is like the 10th crisis we've had in the last 25 years. And to me, it all gets back to the compensation system. Bill, here's a fascinating question. Uh, Paulson claimed that the world could go into an abyss if we didn't bail out AIG and the Wall Street firms. Do you believe that's true? Well, let's see. Um, I want to correct the questioner a little bit. So uh, he, he bailed out Bear Stearns. He bailed out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. He didn't bail out Lehman. He bailed out AIG. He made the Washington Mutual, uh, you know, got sold after it was taken over by the FDIC. And they made Wachovia do a deal. Uh, so their, their strategy was all over the map, OK? Uh, and, um, you know. Who, who, who knows, really? Uh, uh, you know what? I, I guess I'm more and more thinking that it would have been ugly. It, it would, everyone would have been incredibly fearful, just like they were in September and October. I mean, when, when the Congress voted down TARP 1, uh, you know, I thought the country was going to have a cow, right? I mean, it was, it, was, it was incredible. I mean, the stock market dropped 700 points. I think it was the largest single-day drop in history. And... Uh, there was a huge amount of fear. Uh, if they had let, I mean, so they did let Lehman go, and it became this Terminator 2 kind of character and reformulated itself. AIG would have done the same thing. I mean, AIG uh, would have caused more uh, of problems, I, I agree, because it had counterparties all over the world. But it would have meant, you know, and, and, and it's probably true that uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, which was close to the brink, and Goldman, which was close to the brink, may have failed. Uh, if AIG had gone down, because they certainly would have been out, in Gil Goldman's case, $13 billion that it wouldn't have gotten. And uh, you know, at a time uh, when things are not looking good, they had gotten $10 billion uh, in the week before. Then they got, thir or uh, the week later, and they got $13 billion the week before. That, that $23 billion probably helped them a lot. And Morgan Stanley got something similar. So uh, you know, AIG was, I mean, and talk about something, a black box nobody knew anything about. I mean, it's just extraordinary. And, and the fact that it happened you know, within hours of Lehman Brothers, it, it's just uh, it's mind-boggling. But I, I think that you know, had AIG gone under, we, we really could have been into some serious fireworks. Mike, we, we teach ethics uh, in our College of Business. And we have the Euclea Center, of course. And we try and impart the, the importance of ethics in, in, in both personal and professional activities. Uh, what, what lessons can we all draw from this, uh, this sordid experience? Well, it sort of goes, I was thinking about some of the things that, that Mr. Cohen had said. 
And he referred back to the way mortgages used to be made before securitization. Uh, you go to your banker, uh, the bank would evaluate you, and if you got the loan, then that banker and you had a long-term relationship. Uh, so it was about relationships. And then with securitization, it seems like it's gone from relationship to transactions. And once the transaction's completed and I get my fee, then I'm out of the, the game, so to speak. So, I, you know, the whole system has changed, so I, I'm just going to bat the ball over to Mr. Cohen now Thank you. and say in a world where it seems like uh, uh, the compensation is really based upon transactions completed, how do we uh, maintain the ethical leadership that's needed to avoid some of these crises? Thank you, Art. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 is, that is a superb question and goes to the heart of this. And uh, it, go, it goes to the, you know, the heart of human, human nature. I mean, you know, Wall Street used to be about these relationships and these long-term relationships. And uh, I think that, that, that ethos, the, the mores of Wall Street, as I discussed, changed when they went public. Uh, and you know, then all of a sudden, these firms had to live quarter to quarter. Uh, they were evaluated by research analysts who were saying, hey, you know, Morgan Stanley is doing that, and they have a higher return on equity, and then, then Goldman Sachs, what's your problem? Why aren't you doing this? And, you know, that, so, so uh, I think that you do have to get back, uh, and the only solution I have is, you know, to uh, have one of the litmus tests for a, a new CEO on Wall Street be ethics and moral character and fiber, and the willingness to take responsibility for your actions and not be a slitherer, uh, which is completely anathema to Wall Street culture, by the way. Uh, but but bar, barring that, I think that if you got back to this skin in the game concept where they had their entire net worths on the line, those people making the decisions, I, you would get them to be, to, to be a lot more focused. I mean, again, not, not to come to Goldman Sachs's defense uh, again, but if you look at what they did, Unlike every other firm on Wall Street, in addition to this long-term financing that I described, in December 2006, they decided to uh, they, didn't, they decided they didn't like the risks that they thought were in the mortgage market, and, and they decided to pull back and start betting against the mortgage market, and they decided that there was it was too risky for them to be long. Now, of course, that didn't stop them from continuing to underwrite mortgage-backed securities, which they did throughout 2007 which is an ethical dilemma that I think they face as a firm. But it, it, the bulk of their investment, they had decided to place on the mortgage market failing. Now, the reason that they did that is because they actually have a partner class, which is a vestige from when they were a partnership, that looks a lot like what I'm describing with the skin in the game security. They, they have about 300 partners at the firm who get paid out of the pre-tax profits of the firm. I mean, it's incredible. It's like the best of all possible worlds because they get paid out of the pre-tax profits of the firm, which they're looking to maximize, but they don't have any of the personal liability because it's a corporation. So, so they get these pre-tax profits, but they don't have their, their full net worths on the line. But because they're trying to maximize these pre-tax profits, they decided that they were suffering too many losses in the mortgage market on their trading desk. And so they decided to change gears in December of 2006. By the way, everybody else on Wall Street was going gun great guns the other way. So you know, this was, there was some gutsiness to this call. And, and uh, you know, they were able to do that. So uh, that's, a, that's a simple example of how if you do have, or if you think like a partnership, if you think like your money is on the line, you're going to take different steps than if you think it's other people's money. So some combination of, of serious ethical tests and character tests combined with them having real skin in the game is the only thing I can think of. Bill, there's a lot of anger out there. As you know, a TARP was not easily voted and a lot of folks voted against it, uh, but it finally passed. But, but people seem to get it that, that these guys were gambling on their money and they lost and now they're coming back for the handout and before you can blink, they're back to business as usual with raising interest rates and all that. And uh, a related question is here, how can you change the fat cat compensation method 
to make them have, to use your term, more skin in the game. Because people see these people going to vacations in Hawaii and huge, comp it, it's barely 12 months and, and they're back at it. There they go, like Greg would say, there you go there again. There you go again. Well, I've talked a lot about this and uh, I'm the only one, uh, you know, uh, when I first started talking about the compensation system on Wall Street and how flawed it was, uh, I went on CNBC, I wrote a column for uh, uh, the FT about this in like February of, uh, of 08, before all this crisis even started happening. Uh, and um, I went on CNBC and they attacked me. Literally, you can, you can go look at the tape. Uh, uh, they, they being? They, they the other uh, uh, anchor, the, you know, Charlie Gasparino and Dennis Neal and the CNBC cast of characters. You know, how dare I talk about uh, the compensation on Wall Street, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And because, uh, you know, I was obviously, you know, those, were all, those people were all their sources and they didn't like the fact that I was criticizing them. Uh, so I feel like I'm kind of the only one talking about this and uh, that doesn't make me popular. Uh, but I really think this is, a, this is at one of the roots of this. There are others. I mean, there's the rating agencies, there's the regulatory, there's, there's, there's Congress. Uh, but, but, I, but, you know, one thing that Wall Street can do itself is fix this compensation system. And, uh, you know, what, what you have now is you have the Ken Feinbergs of the world and you have all these, you know, smoke and mirrors that they're doing, like clawbacks and all this stuff. It's all just, you know, sops to, you know, to avoid the real, uh, uh, confronting the real problem. And, you know, what can I, t write your Congress, I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but well, uh, I'm going to keep talking about it. I don't want to end this on a negative note. No, we'll, we'll have a few not. more questions, yeah. but... This audience member says, in February, President Obama warned America that we may face a lost decade like Japan. Uh, would you agree with that? No, I, no, I, I actually don't agree with that because this is one of those situations, and I'm not, not only saying this because you don't want to end up on an upbeat note, but I, I think that the, the, the American spirit, you know, is alive and well. We are an industrious people, I mean, you know, unlike Japan, we, we have confronted some of these issues earlier uh, with, with some level of honesty and integrity, not nearly where I think it should be, but, you know, you know we have recapitalized the banks, those that are left. Uh, you know, it, I think it's safe to say that some aspects of the capital markets are working well again. We have not uh, pushed loans down to small and new businesses that need them desperately. Uh, and capital is needed so that they can grow. Uh, so I, I and, and I, you know, I think we at least talk about, you know, becoming less energy dependent and, you know, you know, take, doing steps to, to become leaders in technology, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think this does put us in an advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis Japan in the last decade. But, I mean, we have dug a very deep hole for ourselves. We've got huge budget deficits. We've got... You know, uh, you know, we've become the largest creditor nation in the world. You know, we're going to have to do a lot of growing to get out of all this, and uh, I think we're all going to have to pull together. I mean, we need some sort of post-9-11 spirit again to pull together and get out of this. We have a lot of students out there, and uh, what would you want to say to our young people about what the previous generation has or has not done? We, we see a lot of folks interested in, in things other than just making money in this town. So what do I say other than plastics? <laughs> the graduate, 1960-something. Nice. Uh, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not a proselytizer or anything, but I mean, what's worked for me is um, to, to really uh, follow your passions, you know, do what really makes you happy. I mean, I spent 17 years on Wall Street. Uh, where I said, you know, we used to say to people that, that it was only good one day a year. <laughs> the, the day I got paid my bonus. Otherwise, it was miserable. So, I mean, don't do that. You know, d stay in school, kids. Uh, you know, <laughs> d d don't do that. Really, you know, do what you believe in. Do what you feel passionate about. And I think if you do that, you'll be happy, and then good things will come. I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm living proof of that. I hate to be Pollyannish about it, but... You know, my father wanted me to go into business and uh, go to Wall Street. I did that for 17 years. I always wanted to be a writer, and you know, now I'm a writer. So there you go. And a good writer. Well, and, I you know, know uh, 
Let me just close on, on the note of uh, uh, addressing any problem. The first thing you have to do is, 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 is find out what the problem is caused by before we can fix it. And your work, uh, your books, and your journalism, and your television appearances have, have helped clarify to so many Americans what this is all about. So let's again thank our distinguished speaker for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much.